Hello, everybody. Terrence Lake, you here with another episode of the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, where we talk philosophy from the farm. My guest today is Paul Grieve from Primal Pastures and Pasture Bird. Together, we'll discuss how he got involved in farming, how they started, how they defined primal, their work with the billion dollar buyer, and so much more. Enjoy this episode with Paul Grieve. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Now, before we get too far down the road, can you share a brief biographical sketch with the audience? Yes. So we're far from the conventional way that you normally start a farm. It was actually an accidental situation that happened with us. So back in 2012, my family had some health problems and we started eating better and buying more grass-fed and free-range and pasture meat. And we started diving into these labels and these companies that were producing the food, and we were pretty dissatisfied with our options there in the grocery store. So we were joking around about getting 50 chicks, and wouldn't it be funny to raise some birds in our backyard? And my brother-in-law took it a little more seriously, and he disappeared from the room, came back about five minutes later, and he said, oh, hey, guys, I just ordered 50 chicks. They're going to be here in two weeks. Bless his heart. We had no idea what to do, but that's how we got into this. So tell me about the farm. Uh, how much land do you guys farm? What's your general production model? What do you raise? So we have about 140 acres under production. We're 100% pasture-raised livestock. We do sheep, we do pigs, and then our main business is chicken. So we do a lot of broiler chickens. Um, everything we do is rotational. So it's, the, the birds are all on a daily move, irrigated pasture poultry system. And then the sheep and the pigs, we do a dorper sheep for meat. And then we do a cooney cooney pig also for meat. And they're also on a constant move kind of basis. I'm a little curious. The farm's name is Primal Pastures. What do you mean when you say primal? Right. Okay. So Primal Pastures was the original name that we came up with. That's our direct to consumer line farm stores is all goes under Primal Pastures. The idea of primal is really just like the, the original or the, the, the original concept of what would have happened with a pasture. So we try to get back to nature. Uh, we really believe fundamentally that like nature knows best. And if we can just replicate nature, then our animals are going to be healthier. Soil is going to be taken care of well. And the food is going to be full of nutrients. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind the primal. And then pastures is because everything we do revolves around the pasture. We still the Joel Salatin idea of being grass farmers first and then the grass kind of takes care of the animals. Mm -hmm. I was recently reading, gosh, I always start out a sentence like this. Oh, I was reading uh, Richard Riswall's book on uh, the organic farmers, the organic market gardeners business book. And he was talking about solar dollars. And it was really interesting because he, solar dollars are the abundant dollars. They're dollars that basically just get produced by the sunlight and that's really what grass and growing vegetation does is it takes the sunlight and it converts it into energy converts it into the meat that we then consume yeah i was just talking to a beef farmer yesterday that said we have no inputs like we just move water troughs around and the sunlight is what grows the grass the grass feeds the cows and that's the only input that there is you know so that's a it's a cool way to look at it yeah, I mean, that's the most, that's the basic system. And it's always good to see farmers yeah. going back to it. Yeah, it's obviously a little, a little more involved when you get into monogastrics. And, you we, you know, we farm chicken and pigs, which require mm -hmm. a lot more than just grass. But um, that's still at the fundamental you know, foundation of what we do. So I'm curious, 50 chicks arrive. Were you guys like, what the heck are we doing? Where did you go to dis figure out what you were doing with these 50 chicks? Well, just in the back of our heads, we just wanted to do it the way that we would want to eat it, which would be outside on grass. Luckily, my father-in-law had been a Joel Salatin fan before that. So he enjoyed his talks and he's, he'd read a couple of his books. And so he said, okay, well, we need to build this you know, 10 by 12 foot floorless shelter. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what you're talking about. It was like a foreign <laughs> language to me. But uh, we got the Salatin style chicken tractor built. 
and we brooded the birds and we sort of we started pulling around the field. It was actually pretty cool. I kind of get what's going on here. And it got me really excited when I found out that you can raise food that's really good for the land and the soil, high animal welfare, and a really nutritious product for the consumer. So at what point did you guys say, hey, this can be a business? To be honest, it took a little while. So about two weeks into that first batch, we were getting the birds out of the brooder, and I thought, well, this is expensive. None of us had really any money going into this. Um, and so I posted something on Facebook. I said, like, hey, if anybody wants, we're raising some pasture-raised chickens. If you want to reserve yours, here's a link. 25 bucks, and you can reserve yours. So I put all 50 on there just thinking nobody would ever buy that. You know, they don't sell that many. But, like, within three weeks, all 50 chickens had been deposits collected, you know, paid in full kind of thing. It's like, oh, <laughs> that's crazy, you know. So then I still have a total hobby. I mean, there's no way this thing was going to be a business. But then the next, the next month, we did a, a batch of 100. And then after that batch finished, same thing happened. We had a waiting list of like 100 families, and like we did like 200. And then eventually we kind of started thinking, like a, a year down the road, we started thinking, wow, this is actually a thing. Like we have 400 customers now. You know, we're driving all over Southern California, delivering this product. Like I was working as a CPA. I was working from 5 in the morning till you know, work started for my real job doing farming and then I'd do my real job all day and then I'd do you know farming from 5 p.m. back to 9 to 9 p.m. it was like I think there might be a real thing and I was so sick of my job at that point mm-hmm. sitting around in a cubicle doing stuff I really didn't care about that I just I jumped ship so the business was not ready for a full-time employee yet but I could just see the writing on the wall and I knew that I could make this thing work if I gave it my full attention so my wife and I and our one-year-old son moved in with her parents, with our with my in-laws, and we lived with nine people in this 1,700-square-foot house for like a year, taking no salary, just, you know, racking up credit card debt, trying to minimize our expenses any way possible, and just like full devotion to getting this thing off the ground. Awesome. And you guys have it definitely... Wasn't that awesome. I was having this conversation with a farm friend of mine who he's actually just sold his house so that he can live simply and put everything into his farm. And yeah. when you're willing to make those short term, the short term sacrifices for long term gains, that's something most people can't do anymore. They just, they no, don't want it really to. really opens up possibilities. You know, and this is not unique to farming it's uh the entrepreneur's story and sort of the american dream and it's like for us it was worth it to sacrifice for a year or two well i mean we're still sacrificing you know mm-hmm. they're be probably making more money and not working as many hours as i had i just gone and done what my mba friends all did um but i think that we're finally starting to reap a lot of the rewards now of what we built just sacrificing back then mm-hmm Now, I'm curious, you guys have a phrase, bugs, not drugs. Would you mind going into that a little bit? (laughs) We're big believers, again, in nature. And so in nature, you don't see animals, you know, walking around eating antibiotics or anything, and they seem to live fine. Um, So one of the things that we found pretty interesting was, like, in the last six years, we've raised almost a half a million brown chickens outside our pasture, moving every single day. You know, there hasn't been... A single day off for the farm since we started, which is kind of crazy. Um, but we've never had to use a single vaccine, antibiotic, drug, or feed additive. It's sort of unheard of in the broiler industry. We had a sick flock. So we've had a sick bird here or there, but we never had a sick flock ever. Um, and so we just kind of like coined this term of bugs, not drugs, meaning our chickens, they don't get synthetic inputs at all, but they're their antibiotic is really fresh air and sunshine and green grass and bugs and worms and all the stuff that chickens are supposed to have. Mm-hmm. Expressing their chickenness. The chickenness of the chicken, as Joel Salatin likes to say. Pasture Bird. Uh, is that a separate company from Primal Pastures? 
Yeah, so in 2012, we started Primal Pastures. We sold direct to consumer online. Got a bunch of customers on there. It was really great. But what we started happening was we're getting these wholesale inquiries. So really great chefs and butchers and grocery stores and you know meal prep companies that would say, hey, we really want pasture-raised chicken. Do you guys do any wholesale? And for three years, we said no. And just as an entrepreneur, it doesn't feel good to turn away that much business. No. <laughs> and we sort of like took an inventory of what we were good at and what we were not good at and what capital would allow us to expand to. And we said, man, Southern California, really perfect environment for doing pasture poultry. It doesn't take a lot of land, mm-hmm. but it does take water and a, and a nice climate uh, and a lot of customers because it doesn't have the shelf life of something like beef does. Mm-hmm. And we have USDA you know, harvest capabilities right here in Southern California. So what if we started this wholesale company to just focus on selling to these restaurants and butcher shops and grocery stores and everything else? And so we formed a, a new company, Pasture Bird. And anybody who farms understands that, you know, retail sales and wholesale sales are two very different animals. Mm-hmm. Even, you know, on the actual animal side, we use a different breed, um, we use a different feed program. We can't do certified organic feed for our wholesale customers. It just puts the price range out of reach mm-hmm. for them. Um, so we rolled out this not organic, still all that is great locally milled, drug free feed. But we did that with the idea of let's bring pasture poultry into restaurants and butcher shops and you know the the folks that can't afford a twenty five dollar whole chicken. Um, but we can still do this really great pasture raised bird that's good for the land and the animal and the consumer and everything else. So we started Pasture Bird back in 2015. Crazy thing, our first client was uh, the, the LA Lakers found us somehow and they, they called and said, hey, can we come down? We're spending all these money on these players. We want to get them the best nutrition. We heard about you guys' chicken. Can we come down and take a look at the farm? So they sent their team chef and their nutritionist down as a team. And they came, they checked out the farm, they did this whole thing, and they said, yeah, we want to start ordering. So our third wholesale client was the L.A. Lakers. And then right after that, the next one was the L.A. Dodgers. So we got our – we got started quick with those guys. <laughs> that is so cool. It was pretty crazy. And then since then, we've added, like, some that you would have heard of, some that you wouldn't have heard of. We worked pretty closely with Wolfgang Puck and his group. Chef Curtis Stone out here. We sell to the Bellagio Hotel, which is Chef Roy, uh, that does Harvest Kitchen. It does an amazing job. We have a bunch of restaurants and and some really really great butcher shops that we work with out here. And yeah, it's it's in its infancy still, but um, we've we're putting down as many or more birds, you know, on a daily move, pasture poultry environment as anybody else in the country now, which is it's a lot of fun. It's fun to be on that cutting edge of scaled up pasture poultry production. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a little curious about some of the the actual production practices in this case, because as I mentioned to you pre-show, I'm from Wisconsin, so Southern California climate, I have no clue what that's like. How is that raising pastured poultry? I mean, do you have have an extended growing season? Uh, How long is it? So that's what's kind of crazy good and bad about this is that we've never had a month off. So we can produce year-round pasture poultry here. We actually harvest twice a week, 52 weeks a year. Um, sounds terrible for people that have an off-season that, like, enjoy their time doing that. But <laughs> for us, it's been a lack of period of learning because we don't ever have to stop. And the equipment, you know, it's in use all year-round. Our employees are working all year-round. It's kind of opened up a lot of opportunities for us. Um, that climate down here, though, is, I mean, it's unbelievable for humans and for chickens. So it sort of ranges between 90 degrees and like 60 degrees for about 95% of the year. Our extreme highs and lows are somewhere like 110 and maybe 25. Um, and that happens to be a really, really great environment for birds the problem down here is land is very expensive regulations are very tight mm-hmm. um yeah, it's not super friendly to the farmer but what we have to balance that out is 22 million people within an hour and a half of my farm um one of the best food food movements in the world you know happening between la and san diego and orange county and even out here in riverside county and palm springs um we have a huge market you know so 
everywhere you go is going to have its pros and cons, but we thought that chicken, pasture poultry specifically, overlaid really well into the advantages that we have here in Southern California. And that's really great. That's really great. Now, I'm curious. When I first started talking to you about being on the show, I saw a couple of things about you guys being involved with laundries and the billion-dollar buyer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, they called us uh, almost a year ago now, and they said, hey, we'd love to feature a farm, a chicken farm from California on our show. And the show, if you haven't seen it before, is on CNBC. It's called Billion Dollar Buyer. It's sort of like in the vein of these Shark Tank and The Profit and some of these guys. But the show is um, Tillman Fertitta, who's a Texas restaurateur. It's actually the biggest restaurateur in the world. He owns like 600 properties you know, under sole ownership. And the show is he comes out, looks at a small business. It can be in food or, you know, furniture or anything else that would fit into his properties. And he sees if he wants to make a deal. And then we sort of televise this deal that we that we make with him. So in ours, he came out to the farm, looked at the birds. You know, the storyline was kind of like, hey, you guys don't have enough chicken to supply my restaurants. You know, can you scale up? And so we took some time. We scaled up. And then uh, he came back, and we did about a quarter million dollar deal with him. It's not an investment; it's just a PO, so it's a, mm-hmm. it's a purchase order for birds every single week. He's going to buy, I think it was two hundred something birds, but actually already went up to like five hundred birds a week that he's buying now. Wow! For some of his restaurants, and that was all on TV, so it was a it was a lot of fun. They did do a blind taste test, which we were involved with which is probably the most nerve-wracking thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> uh, it, they blind taste tested us versus an organic free-range chicken. So that was uh, that was pretty nerve-wracking, but it, our product did really well in that blind taste test. Thank God I was nervous about that. Isn't that always like a great level of satisfaction when, I mean, especially if you're living on the farm and that's what you consume as a general day-to-day, then you try something else and you're like, oh, wow. I forget how much better my food is than the typical fare out there. Yeah, but even in our space, it's like wild seafood, you know? You eat it for the health of the product, and you eat it for the health of the oceans, and, you know, grass-fed beef. Most people, not most, but a lot of people don't really prefer the taste of grass-fed beef to, to feedlot beef. They would actually rather eat feedlot beef for the taste, so... For us, it's like we don't even really do passion poultry for the taste. Mm-hmm. If it does taste better, then that's awesome. And it kind of should because they're outside eating green grass and bugs and worms and seeds and it's a slower life and all that stuff. But it just freaked me out a little bit when we went up against this bird that's really manufactured for taste. I mean, yeah. Free range organic sort of capable models, like they build that bird for taste. We have other objectives in, in mind with ours. And if it happens to taste better, then that's great. But it was a little bit nerve-wracking for us, for sure. It was funny because I actually had this conversation with uh, my father the other day. He's a, He was an organic farmer, and that's how kind of how I got involved in this. But even though he raised organic grass-fed beef, he still prefers that little bit of grain taste. Whereas I'm the complete opposite. I, I very much like a lean meat, so... I just naturally enjoy eating grass-fed beef more than he does. Just comes down to kind of what your preference is. Most folks, if you took a poll, I think would probably prefer a little bit of grain finishing, and that's fine. You know, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with different consumer taste preferences. But when a product is healthier, mm-hmm. people will buy it for the health, even if it doesn't taste quite as good. So when we went up, it was three different chefs that prepared the dish, you know, for four people, and we all had to vote each time that we went around. So, thank God, uh, we won nine out of 12. So, we were wow. about 75% preferred to 25%, which was definitely a blessing because uh, some of these dishes, I mean, they were covered in cheese, and you could barely even taste the chicken and stuff. So, we got uh, a little bit lucky on that, too. Now, one of my final questions here for you is, uh, I actually watched the TEDx talk you did, which we'll link in the show notes. But you specified that you guys practice regenerative agriculture and make a distinction that's different than sustainable agriculture. 
Would you mind explaining the nuance between the two a little bit? Yeah, it's one of the things that I nerd out about the most and that I love the most about what we do is that we could actually heal the soil and make better the dirt underneath our farm every single year just by the way that we manage livestock. It doesn't have to do with anything with synthetic inputs or, you know, what we're adding to the soil or anything. It's truly the way that we um, So in nature, you have these large animals of livestock that eat the grass, they poop on the ground, and they move to the next spot constantly. And so we replicate that. We use electric fencing for our sheep and pigs. We use flawless chicken tractors for the birds. But everything on the farm is constantly moving. And so what happens is a lot of animals all in one spot poop on the ground, you know, eat, eat most of the grass, we still keep some grass on earth, and then we'll move them to the next spot. And that manure becomes the best fertilizer in the world, better than anything any of these chemical companies could have ever come up with. And every single year, we put more nutrition back into the soil, we rest the land for like 90 days in between grazing, and it allows them the soil to actually absorb the manure, the nutrients from that manure, and build a better, healthier grassland for the next year. And so we just finished doing some soil testing, and just in two years, just by managing the animals the way that we do, it increased the soil organic matter by like 50% in two years, which is a, it's a pretty big jump here in Southern California. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a testament to kind of the way that nature works. It's not that we're awesome or we're doing something really special or unique. These are old school farming practices, crop rotations, animal rotations. Uh, and it's kind of bringing them back and saying, hey, the price isn't the end all to be all. Really, we need to take good care of our soil. And by doing that, we can grow a grassland that even sequesters carbon, which is a huge issue in the environment right now. How do we get the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back where it belongs, which is really in the soil? We have a third of the carbon in the soil that we did 200 years ago. We have three times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere that we did 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like, where do you think that belongs? Yeah. It's one of those things that I'm hearing more and more people talk about, regenerative versus sustainable. I'm an organic inspector by trade, and so obviously with uh, Rodale's regenerative standards that they're starting to discuss, uh, we're having a lot more conversations about. So I'm excited to see actual farmers really going after this idea of regenerative agriculture. Well, I'm one of those ones that's in the camp that says really sustainability isn't possible, you know? Sustainability means that you're truly never getting any better and never getting any worse. And just in life, in finance, in human health, you're kind of either getting better or you're getting worse, you know. And if you really look at the soil, I think you're either going one way or another. It's hard to say over the course of 50 years that you're going to stay in the exact same. So we, we believe in that regenerative model that goes beyond sustainability, at least as a goal. And, I mean, that, that filters finances of our company we want to be constantly regenerating that bank account too and in increasing profits and growing the business and in human health too we don't want to eat you know avoid eating bad foods just so that we don't ever get sick like we want to use food as a tool to actually build our health and build our immune system and vitality too so growth instead of stagnation exactly and the right kind of growth it's not growth you know the end all to be all is not growth, but growth in the right ways, growth in the right spaces. Um, Because, yeah, stagnation is death. I mean, you can't ever really stagnate for a long period of time. You'll just decline eventually. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for being on the show. Uh, Wrapping up here, I actually have one last question for you. I'm sorry. But what is your favorite chicken dish? Ooh. I bounce back and forth on this from crock pot to roast to barbecue and back. But ultimately, I love smoked chicken. I love smoked meats in general. But um, when you put a light smoke on that bird, you know, in a, in a good smoker, and then you pop that in the oven and kind of finish it off some, for some crispy skin, there's a better chicken dish than that. Mm, that does sound good. And now I've once again left the show hungry. But uh, thanks so much again for being on the show. Wrapping up here. Where can people go to learn more about you and your farm? Yeah, there's two websites that we do. So primalpastures.com or anywhere on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Primal Pastures. If you want to see our wholesale and production side of the business, that all goes under PastureBird, which is just pasturebird.com 
same thing, Facebook, Instagram. And then my other plug, I always say this is not just about us. You know, we're just one company doing pasture poultry out of thousands. Um, check out the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association. That's APA, A-P-P-P-A dot org. Uh, that's got a lot of resources, and it'll show you, you know, local pasture poultry farmers in your area. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks a lot. Big thanks to Paul for being on the show today. You can learn more about his farm and the work they do by clicking the links in the show notes or by following Primal Pastures and Pasture Bird on all of the socials. Thanks as always for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a review, letting others know how great the show is. I would also be forever in your metaphorical debt. While you're there, be sure to subscribe using whatever listening medium you choose. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbean, we're on all of them. You can also now subscribe on YouTube and listen to our episodes there, if you're into that. This has been Terrence Lehew and the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast reminding you to keep farming the dream.